Okay, it's going to be a review of the Royal Rumble 2002 from Atlanta, Georgia. I got great memories of the show. This is the first pay-per-view party I ever had. And, uh, you know, the memories still last today. You know, someone just sent me a text for Triple H's uh, return on Raw, the 20th anniversary. So, yeah, I just think this is an extremely exciting time. I think after the invasion, a lot of people kind of jumped on board to see where the company was going. And, uh, yeah, I mean, incredible buy rate, 670,000 buys. So, yeah, this is uh, th this is definitely one of the biggest, you know, non-WrestleMania, non-invasion buy rates that I, th you know, that they've ever done. And probably the most successful, you know, Royal Rumble. And, uh, yeah, you got to give Triple H credit. You know, he, his return injected life into the company. It was it was one of the best returns ever. You know, they, they just built it up really well. You know, there, there's a lot of different reasons as to why, uh, you know, Triple H got the 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 uh, the ovation that he got. I, I, I think I think at that time, like if you were away from the company, your presence was just really missed. I even stated this back in October, like when Austin took two weeks off, you definitely felt it. And so two weeks compared to eight months with Triple H being away, um, I think fans definitely missed him. I, I think the return was really set up very well with the the video packages. I think his speech on Tough Enough kind of let people that didn't really know, you know, how passionate and how serious he was about the business. And then, uh, yeah, when, when Triple H came back, you know, he injected life into the company. But I, I wouldn't say it was all Triple H, though. You almost forget, you know, this is Flair's first match back in the WWF in Atlanta in front of his WCW uh, territory against Vince. So uh, I, I think Flair deserves a lot of credit. I think Jericho deserves a lot of credit. He was a fresh champion, first ever undisputed champion. Looking back on it, I think they made the right choice. And it, it was a weird situation where Jericho was champion, but still the underdog going up against The Rock. And, you know, we know how, you know, Rock going for the title, you know, the evidence is definitely there. It definitely generates uh, more revenue, more buy rates. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think it's more of a collective effort uh, than people think. But, yeah, man, uh, January 2002, I, I just I'm looking back at this month. With those uh, those shows from Madison Square Garden, you know, Austin, I think Austin's babyface turn really kicked into full gear after the 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 supermarket incident with Booker T. I, I think that helped. I, th I think the what stuff was really catching on. You know, Kurt Angle was kind of being the uh, paranoid paranoid heel with the what stuff, and you know, I thought Angle actually got some really really good heat. When he interrupted Triple H's return, and and I think this Rumble too, like when I look back on it, I don't know if you've ever had, you know, four of the greatest of all time all in their prime. Uh, you know, it could have went either way. I, I don't think this Rumble was was as predictable as some people think it was. I think at the time it was it was a little bit more unpredictable because you didn't really know the severity of Triple H's injury. I, I think maybe there was some doubt that he would be able to perform in the main event of WrestleMania. So you still had, you had Austin, you had Undertaker, you had Angle, you had Triple H, you know, four of the greatest of all times, all in their prime. Either either four of them could have um, could have won this Royal Rumble. So I, I think I think that's probably the biggest reason, you know, for that buy rate as well. So, so let's get right into it. Uh, first match of the night, we got Taz and Spike Dudley, the tag team champions. Actually taking on uh, the Dudleys with Stacy Keebler. I, I got to say, the match really did hold up. It, it was short and it was sweet. I thought Stacy gave it a nice primetime feel. You know, she uh, she looked awesome out there. Uh, she actually took some bumps too. You know, Taz actually was going to hook on the Taz mission. She took a bump. And then Taz actually wins this thing with the Taz mission. And uh, Taz and Spike Dudley actually retained the titles. And... What's funny is I I think this 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 match are either no way out. I think Taz was pretty much done with wrestling at this point. He just has such a bad neck. But uh, but yeah, you almost forget that Taz and Spike Dudley uh, were tag team champions. I remember they were in the match, but I I was assuming that the Dudleys were the champions at the time. But uh, that was definitely not the case. But you know the the important thing is when you when you look at this Royal Rumble undercard, 
It's very short. Uh, the first three matches are all under 10 minutes and uh you know that 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 just has to do with the royal rumble match they uh, they they just wanted to save extra time for the rumble there's two minutes in between entrances so this is actually the longest rumble ever it, it almost goes about 70 minutes so and i do remember at the pay-per-view party this guy was like oh man this is the worst rumble ever like what's up with these finishes like the like you had crappy finish after crappy finish to, to start the show and so looking back on it i guess that would just explain it you just wanted to save time you know for the actual rumble okay so next up for the intercontinental championship you got william regal uh taking on edge so i think at the time edge is the ic champion uh, Regal's actually the challenger here, and yeah, I, you know what the, the 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 styles here just didn't really mix. Um, when you look at the ending here, Edge actually spears the referee. You know, Regal takes the brass knucks and clocks Edge with it, and Regal actually wins with the brass knucks. And he cuts a promo saying that he believes in the power of the punch, or it was the power of the pump punch that you know propelled him the victory. And um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different ways of looking at this. I, I was not a big fan of the Regal Edge uh, series, all the brass, brass knucks on a pole match, a, a lot of the stuff that they did with the brass knuckles. I think, uh, yeah, I don't really think it, it, it really worked that well. Um, in, in some ways, though, I, I feel like it, it gave Regal really good heat, but it, it just seems like a lot of people really look back at the, the Edge and Regal stuff very negatively. And th that's the thing about Edge. Like, I, I think Edge is one of the best ever, but I, I, I still can't put him in that category with, like, uh, Bret Hart, Chris Benoit, Brian Danielson. I, I just feel like there's certain guys that he just doesn't gel with, and, and Regal's definitely one of them. Uh, you know, A-Train was another one, and The Miz is another one. Another one. I, I feel like a, a guy like Bret Hart or Brian Danielson, you know, they're so good that they could really adapt, you know, to any style. And it was just, it was just a little bit unorthodox, you know, Regal style mixing it, mixing it in with uh, with Edge's WWE style. It was just, uh, it's just kind of weird. But you know, a lot of guys just didn't really gel well with Regal. Like the the one guy that really did was uh, with was Chris Benoit. But you know, you could definitely argue that the Regal and Benoit stuff, for as good as it was, it wasn't like it was kind of. You know, they kind of went, went away from that traditional WWE style of a match. But, yeah, you know, the Regal Edge stuff at the Rumble, it just, uh, I, I just think at, at the time it was underwhelming. And it just, it really just didn't age well. I think the only positive thing it did was just, just uh, you know, the brass knucks. For some reason, I, I just feel like the brass knucks more than anyone, uh, you know, Regal's pretty much been, you know, associated with it, you know, more so than any other wrestler. So next up, you got uh, Trish Stratus uh, taking on Jazz uh, for the Women's Championship. So, yeah, the, this, this was good stuff while it lasted. It was very, very short. Uh, in the video package, Jazz actually takes this, uh, this case and jams it on Trish's uh, hand. It looked pretty nasty, but, uh, you know, Trish was, like, all wrapped up. Her hand was all wrapped up in this match. But, yeah, very, uh, very hard-hitting, very fast-paced. Um, some of the Trish, some of the, the kickouts when Trish kicked out of, they looked a little abrupt. But, yeah, you know, very physical. And uh, for the amount of time that it went, they, they did a lot of good stuff. Uh, Trish actually retained with a bulldog uh, out of nowhere, but uh, but yeah, I I thought you know Jazz and uh, Jacqueline was actually the guest referee, but you know Jazz, Jazz really proved in this match that you know she was a good opponent for Trish, and uh, you know it, it, the the matches just felt like an, another level of physicality compared to you know anything Trish had ever done before. So yeah, definitely a, a, a step in the right direction for Trish. Okay, so next up we got Vince McMahon taking on Ric Flair in in a street fight. Okay, so Flair makes his return to the company. He's the co-owner of the uh, World Wrestling Federation after Shane and Stephanie sold their stock to the custodium. So you have that whole situation where Flair is the, the part owner and, and Vince is actually scratching his ear like he can't believe what he's hearing. It's one of the corniest uh, Vince McMahon facial expressions. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, this was... Um, this was definitely something to see. I mean, the uh, the the, the build-up, it seemed to go on forever. 
Ultimately, this is the reason why Vince brought in the NWO from a storyline uh, uh, standpoint, you know, because, you know, he, he couldn't, you know, coexist with Ric Flair. And if Flair is the owner, then he has to kill what he created. So, uh, so yeah, we could talk about the buildup all day. You know, the, the buildup was pretty cool. I, I think the skit where Vince was at uh, Madison Square Garden when he dressed up as Flair with the wig and, and the robe and then he hit Flair with the steel pipe. That was pretty good build up right there. But yeah, I mean the story of of this match was Vince though. Like uh Vince looked really jacked up and it's it's funny watching this match back after watching the the dark side of the ring, the the steroid uh scandal. But yeah, the bottom line was uh yeah, I don't think Vince ever, you know, looked more jacked up or celebrated his phys- physique more than he ever did in this match. I mean, it, it was crazy. I mean, he was just, every time he pushed Flair, he would just uh, pose. Yeah, and, so, <laughs> and some of the facial expressions were just really laughable, really corny, it, it really over the top. Uh, you know, Vince's selling for some of Flair's chops were uh, really f- fun to see as well. So yeah, it was really fun. It really is fun. If you, if, if you don't take Vince McMahon that serious and just kind of, you know, have fun with his matches, it, it was definitely something to see. It, and it was, it was really, really weird to see how, yeah, Vince played a good heel here. You know, he really did control, the, he really controlled the bulk of the match. You know, really took, uh, you know, Flair's legs, you know, hit it against a ring post and uh, talking trash to uh, Flair's kids at ringside. I think it was actually Megan and Reed. They were actually at ringside. Uh, yeah, they had a photographer's camera and uh, Megan actually almost dropped the camera when, when Vince kind of, th- you know, kind of nasty, nastily threw it back at her. But, uh, well, yeah, it was good stuff. You know, Flair got the upper hand after he was bloodied up. Flair actually uh, got revenge on Vince and hit him with the, the pipe again. Uh, this time to make Vince bleed. And when he locked on the figure four, <laughs> yeah, this had to be probably one of the most, uh, yeah, I mean, th- this had to be one of the most over-the-top tap-outs I've ever seen. So when Vince Vince tries to fight off the tap-out, and he ends up tapping with both hands, it's like screaming like a baby. So, yeah, I mean, he sold it really well. The, the match was definitely a lot of fun, and, uh, you know, Flair was really over, and it was definitely, um, I, I wouldn't say Flair you know, look great or anything like that. But it, it was it was definitely a um, a sign that his, his, his return to the WWF was actually going to go really well. And I, I think, yeah, I mean, it, it's... When you look back on it, though, like, to, to think that this was Flair's first big match back in the WWF, you know, he was old. I mean, th- this is two guys in their mid-50s going out there and putting on a match. And it was good for what it was. But I, I think at the time, you didn't realize, like, how... How impactful Flair's return was going to be, especially on like the younger generation like like me that really didn't get to get a chance to see Flair's work. Like the WWE really did a beautiful job of marketing Flair like he's one of the greatest of all time, a legend. Okay, next up we got Chris Jericho versus The Rock for the Undisputed Championship. So this is the third match of the trilogy that Jericho and The Rock had on pay-per-view. And uh, yeah. It was, it was, uh, this was definitely great storytelling, uh, to go back to this again. And this, this is a perfect example of, um, promoting the champion as the underdog. And, uh, you know, The Rock, you know, obviously it's well documented how successful, you know, The Rock actually going for the championship has been in the past. So I, I think this was, uh, definitely the right way to go. So the video package did not capture this, but there was a couple of different, you know, backstage segments where I think it was Austin, Undertaker, Kurt Angle, uh, Triple H, you know, they went up to The Rock and, and basically just told him, like, we expect you to win the championship. I just want to let you know I'm going to be facing you at WrestleMania after I win the Royal Rumble. So it was almost like a foregone conclusion that The Rock was going to win this match. And, um, you know, The Rock was taking a shot at Jericho for calling himself the larger-than-life living legend. And The Rock was like, well, you don't know large. What The Rock was referring to is his size 14 boots. going to turn that son bitch sideways and stick it straight up your candy ass. And then Jericho's like, no, I am not a joke. I am serious, and you won't look past me, you stupid son of a bitch. And The Rock was like, The Rock is not taking this as a joke, Chris Jericho. I'm taking you very seriously. If you smell what The Rock is cooking, and then bang. So that, that leads you to the, the, the match at the Royal Rumble. So yeah, very well built up. Uh, the, the promo and, and this match is definitely the highlight 
of uh, Jericho's undisputed championship reign. And uh, yeah, I thought this was great. I, 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 would, I would say the No Mercy match where Jericho won the WCW title. I still think that's the best of everything that they had. But, you know, Rock and Jericho did not have a bad match. This match here at the Rumble, I, I thought it was great. Um, I, I thought Rock looked like... An, Rock was definitely in his prime from, um, from an in-ring standpoint. I don't think Rock ever looked better. I thought Jericho looked like a champion. I, I, you know, Jericho looked like he trained really hard on the weights, but he was still able to move really well in this match. So this was beautiful because... You know, even even though Jericho won the way he won, it, it, it made him look like he was, you know, the kind of champion that was very difficult to outsmart. You know, and, and in a lot of ways, Jericho really opened the door up for, you know, this type of over the top, you know, cocky, uh, arrogant heel, um, you know, talking about how the whole world revolves around him because he's the undisputed champion. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, really, really good stuff here. Uh, I, I just think Jericho is probably the, the best at, you know, countering a lot of the Rock's offense. You know, some of the counters to the Rock bottoms are really, really just well laid out. Um, you know, Rock looked like he really got angry at Jericho for mocking the people's elbow. Jericho is about to do a, a Rock bottom on the announce table. Rock actually counters it. And Rock bottoms Jericho from one table to the next through the announce table. I got to say, that's probably the best rock bottom I've ever seen uh, through the Spanish announce table because, you know, it was, it was on one table and delivered onto the other one. So I thought that came off really cool. You know, Jericho had interference from uh, Christian and Lance Storm. Kind of, you know, it was kind of a temporary, you know, Canadian coalition type of stable, but it didn't really last so long. Jericho never really, you know, uh, officially entered the un-American uh, Canadian stable. Eventually, that would become more of a thing uh, later on that year. But uh, yeah, uh, th this is just about the referee. So Earl Hebner actually took a ref bump from a rock lariat, you know, that flying lariat that the rock does. So then Nick Patrick came out, tried to be the substitute referee. He wouldn't count for the rock after a DDT. So rock actually rock bottoms him. So after rock actually hits the people's elbow on Jericho, he's trying to wake up Earl Hebner. As that's going on, Jericho gives him a low blow, throws him into the exposed turnbuckle, and then rolls him up and gets his foot on the rope for the pinfall. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it was really well done. You know, it was it was it's a heel Jericho victory, but at the same time, like it um, it makes it look like The Rock could have won this thing had the ref had the referee not been biased. And it, in some ways, it just it, it was a satisfying finish, though. It, it was it was a satisfying heel finish for Jericho. It, it kind of made The Rock look like he was unselfish, a team player. Uh, and I, I think that's one of the great things about The Rock. I, I think it was reported that Meltzer said, like, th there's never been a star as big of the rock, as, as The Rock that's done as, as many jobs as The Rock has done. My take on it is I just think, like, when... You know, if if you're that if you're confident in your abilities, if you're confident enough to get yourself over, then, you know, doing a job for a guy like Jericho shouldn't be that big of a deal. And I think The Rock proved at WrestleMania that, you know, losing to Jericho here really didn't make a difference. So, yeah, uh, great stuff between Rock and Jericho. Meltzer gave it four and a quarter stars. Uh, this is one case where I feel like he did not underrate the match. I definitely agree. Four and a quarter. Not quite as good as in the No Mercy match, but... Uh, yeah, this really kind of solidified Jericho and The Rock as, you know, one of, you know, so, some of the best chemistry uh, on the roster at this time. So, yeah, really, really good stuff. Awesome, awesome match right there. Okay, and next up we got the Royal Rumble match. The longest Royal Rumble match in history. And I, I got to say this about the match. I, I think, you know, you, you, you did not have, I don't think you've ever had, you know, a, you know, four of the greatest of all time all in their prime you know, unpredictable about which way it was going to go. So I think that's what stands out about the match. And I just think from a talent standpoint, you know, there's really not a lot of weak links. Like there's, there's not, there's not that one guy in the match where I could just say, Oh, he didn't, didn't really belong. I mean, to be honest with you, the, the weakest pop of the night was probably Farouk and, and Farouk is a former champion in WCW. So, and even in the beginning here, like the, the beginning, you know, the, the first 10 entrants, that was probably the weakest the match was. But you still had guys that, that went on to win the Intercontinental Championship, guys that were tag team champions. So, yeah, I, I, just, I think from top to bottom, uh, at least to this point, it, it had to be one of the most 
uh, you know, star-studded Royal Rumbles ever. So we actually start off with Rikishi and uh, Goldust actually returning uh, to start this thing. And, and I'll tell you, one of the things you notice about the Rumble, it, it, it feels like it's just broken up into parts. There's not like one guy that lasts the whole match like a Ric Flair or a Shawn Michaels. It, it's almost like The Undertaker was the star of the first part. Austin's the star of the second part. And then the third part, the stars are Triple H and Kurt Angle. That's kind of how it came off to me. Kind of like a Pulp Fiction type of feel to it. But uh, yeah, when Undertaker came out, came out to a great ovation and that's the kind of that's that's what sucks about watching the show back on dvd this dvd it doesn't have the kid rock cocky theme song and uh you know if anyone watched the pay-per-view live that that theme really fit well with this pay-per-view and once again undertaker does not come out with the rolling rolling theme so yeah if, if anyone uh, th that's one of the great things about keeping the vhs's that we recorded live during the pay-per-view you keep it because you you could you could definitely relive that that same music that same feeling like when Undertaker came out because Taker got a huge pop he was awesome here he was dominant you know Taker with the new look with the haircut and the weight loss uh, you know Undertaker really he he kind of I I think it was just foreshadowing that he was going to have a great year in 2002 and eventually he did win the undisputed championship but yeah. Uh, it, when when the Hardys came out, they worked really well with uh, Undertaker. You know, the Jeff and Matt, I, th I believe they had done some stuff with Taker after he turned heel. So they were trying to kind of get their revenge on him. After Taker eliminated the Hardys and Lita, they wouldn't leave the ring. And then the fans actually started booing. They didn't start booing the Hardys until they were until after they were eliminated because they wouldn't leave the ring. They, they tried ganging up on Taker again. But, you know. They wanted to set up the whole Maven thing, so it definitely made sense. So Taker was like, get your ass on out of here. And as he's yelling at the Hardys, Maven's already in the ring, drop kicks Taker over the top rope. So Maven eliminates the Undertaker. It was probably, it was probably one of the most memorable things about the Rumble. Uh, I wouldn't say it was the most memorable thing, but you know they, they, they used the Maven thing to do a lot of different things. They, they used the Maven thing to set up Rock and Undertaker. Because, you know, Rock cut this promo about how, yeah, we knew Jericho was going to win, but what a night for the Rumble. Maven eliminating The Undertaker. So Taker is like, well, who's who's the Rock to even bring up the fact that, that Maven eliminated me? So it, it jump-started that. It also led to a Jericho and Maven uh, match because Maven was never technically eliminated from the Rumble. So remember that promo where Jericho's like, everyone wants to talk about Maven, poor little Maven, 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 Maven. And then that was, I think, the, the match that Jericho had against Maven. That's the only clean victory I think Jericho had as Undisputed Champion. So it was cool. You know, Taker actually, uh, you know, took Maven up. You know, he was beating the crap out of him all over the arena. They actually went up to the popcorn vendor and, and he threw uh, Maven's head into the popcorn. And then Taker actually... Uh, pulled the George Whipple and started uh, actually chewing some of the popcorn. Remember that popcorn? Yum. So, uh, yeah, Taker. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much how Undertaker's night ended. And then you had uh, Christian and DDP kind of, you know, dominated the match until uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin came out. So Austin doesn't come out until uh, 19. So when I, I got to say this. This might sound kind of weird. But I think this is the biggest pop that Austin ever got for the Rumble. Because you got to remember in 1997, you know, he, he, you know, he was still a heel and they still really didn't, you know, mix the song properly. In 1998, when he came out, he came out through the crowd because everybody in the ring was waiting for him. So they were, they were looking at him. So you didn't really know where Austin was coming from. And then in 1999, you, you knew he was going to be one of the first two guys to come out. So, uh, so, and then in 2001, when he came out, Triple H attacked him from behind before the fans really had a chance to digest that he came out. So, so yeah, I would actually say this is Austin's biggest pop. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he was awesome, man. You know, Austin looked in good shape. You know, the fans were behind him every step of the way. They, they chanted what anytime he threw a punch or threw a kick, you know, the, he would, he was, he stunned Christian even after he got eliminated, brought him back into the ring. I thought Austin was a machine here, and in in some ways, it was uh, it almost felt like the fans really weren't ready, you know, to see Austin lose the Rumble. But you know, at the time, Austin had only already won it three times. You know, you have you had seen him dominate the the, the championship scene the whole year. That you know, Triple H just came back. So, uh, but you know, if if you had known that this was going to be Austin's last year 
to really get something, you know, productive out of him, would you have one with Austin versus Scott Hall? You know, probably not. I, I think, you know, if you, you know, tr- you were going to have Triple H at your disposal until 2010 as a full timer. He was going to be in the championship match every single year from 2002 to 2009, potentially, you know. Maybe this would have been, you know, who knows? Maybe if you knew what was going to happen, maybe you would have had Austin win the Rumble for the fourth time. Uh, but who knows? All right. So, uh, so Triple H and Austin. So when Triple H comes out, it's just Austin in the ring. You know, the J- Jim Ross is great. It's like this is what the WWF is all about: two gladiators just going at it. And then the Hurricane came out, tried the double choke slam, uh, Austin and Triple H. And yeah, that was a great moment. It, that was even a moment that people were saying was going to be one of the best moments of the year. So yeah, the, the, the Royal Rumble always has fun moments, and I, I would say the Maven moment and the Hurricane moment uh, really stand out as like you know, uh, you know, memorable moments from like mid Carters. Um, so, you know, you, ha- you actually have Mr. Perfect come out and last, you know, about 15 minutes. He actually made it to the Final Four. Uh, so Angle actually comes out at 26. You know, you know, Big Show actually gets an- eliminated by Kane. Angle does the Angle Slam to, uh, to Kane to eliminate him. So Big Show and Kane, very short appearances for them. Uh, it seemed like everybody knew Van Dam was going to be number 29. So before Van Dam came out, you heard a ton of RVD chants. Uh, and it was great. So RVD looked looked good at first, and once again, you know, it, it, watching it back on DVD, it's it's not, it's the first RVD theme that they used. They they didn't use the breaking point theme here. So that it, it, for some reason, it just it just hurt. It's just not the same reaction that I remembered it. Uh, so yeah, I remember the fans going crazy when Van Dam came out. Uh, so Triple H. Kind of a foreshadowing of things to come. Triple H stopped Van Damme's momentum, hit him with the pedigree, and then when Booker T came out, he kind of he threw RVD over the ring, out of the ring, and then uh, Austin actually stuns Booker T out of the ring there. So the the final four are actually uh, Triple H, Stone Cold, Kurt Angle, and uh, Mr. Perfect. So Angle actually eliminates Austin. You know, as Austin's trying to eliminate Mr. Perfect, Angle gives him a cheap shot, eliminates him. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, Austin doesn't take it very good. He, he, he takes a steel chair and whacks everybody. And as Austin's going to the back, though, it's, it's uh, it, you know, it, it wasn't anything like Hogan. Like, when Hogan got eliminated in 92, it was like, thank God. It wasn't like that. It really, even after three Royal Rumble vid- victories, it definitely felt like the fans just kind of wanted to see Austin stay. It was it was almost, like, hard to take uh, to a degree. So, so Angle was saying that, he doesn't know why, but he, he wishes uh, that they went with uh, Angle versus Austin at WrestleMania 18. And uh, I, I, I definitely think you could have done it looking back on it. You know, the, the, there is definitely something there with Austin as a babyface and Angle as a heel really being paranoid with the what stuff. I, I thought they had really good chemistry in the few matches that they had in, in the winter of 2002. So you, you definitely could have done it, you know, maybe not even for the championship. That definitely would have been the way to go. But I think the mindset was that, you know, Angle versus Austin didn't draw very well in terms of buy rates. And then you had the NWO coming in. And, you know, it, for some reason, they felt like the NWO had a, you know, the, the, their first target was, was actually Austin. So that's how I would explain to, to Kurt. But I, I do agree. I think if you had Angle and Austin face each other at WrestleMania in, in somewhat of an undercard attraction, didn't have to be for the championship, I think it would have made both guys happy. Uh, you know, JR was just saying that it was it was definitely a mental uh, it was a mental roadblock for Austin to get over that the fact that he had to face Scott Hall at WrestleMania. But yeah, the bottom line is uh, Austin's out of the Rumble. You know, the, he he doesn't he already won it three times. He didn't make it. You know, he didn't win the Royal Rumble the fourth time. So yeah, this is Austin's actually last Royal Rumble. Um, so Triple H actually eliminates Mister Perfect, kind of hits him with the clothesline out of nowhere. And then Angle and Triple H go at it once again, just like they did the night Triple H returned. Yeah, good stuff between them. Really, really good stuff. You know, Angle hit the Angle Slam to Triple H out of nowhere after a slingshot. And, uh, yeah, there's just some near eliminations out of the ring. Angle actually looked like he won at one point. He started celebrating prematurely. And then uh, Triple H comes up behind Angle, and he does that thing where he poses. 
I remember Angle even said, Triple H tried doing that, that, that stupid, that thing. And yeah, it looked kind of corny. It really did. But, uh, but yeah, Triple H was actually able to punch Angle a couple times and close lines him out of the ring. So Triple H wins the Royal Rumble 2002 to go to WrestleMania. And I got to say, I I think this was a good rumble. I I really think it was. Um, I I wouldn't say Triple H's performance was anything uh, earth shattering, like from an in-ring standpoint. But yeah, he definitely got the job done. You know, the the fact that he really didn't know if the quad was going to hold up or not. And he was able to still go out there and and give this type of performance. I, I, I think, I think it was good. You know, triple H actually lasted 23 minutes. It's not bad. Like I was saying, this is the longest rumble ever. So Austin actually lasted longer than anybody, you know, almost 27 minutes. So yeah, this, uh, this might've even been longer than his performance at rumble 97. And I'm I'm not sure about that, but, uh, this, I, I got to give it up to Austin besides triple H. He was probably the MVP in terms of just, you know, overall excitement, uh, in this actual rumble, but yeah, you know, coming down to triple H and angle, I I thought it was a a good solid ending here. Uh, like I said, this wasn't a rumble where it's like one, you know, one guy deserves all the credit. This is definitely a a team effort. This is a, a, a collection of just great talent from start to finish. And uh, yeah, awesome, awesome rumble, man. Awesome show. And, uh, you know, the, the, the undercard is what it is. You, you, you kind of understand it. The, you, you definitely had to save time. You didn't want to take any chances. But, uh, but yeah, you got to, you know, uh, the, the, the Flair and Vince stuff, I think it's a lot of fun no matter how you look at it. I think the Undisputed Championship match, um, I think it was better than your average championship match. I really do. I think Rock and Jericho had uh, great chemistry. And like I said, the the, bet, the highlight of Jericho's uh, undisputed championship reign at this show. And then the Royal Rumble, I, I think it's definitely one of the better ones. I, I think it's one of the best. I would definitely, I think it's definitely deserving of a four-star rating. Um, you know, Meltzer said it was, it was the best one that they've done uh, besides 92 and 97. I think I think he said that. So so that's does that imply that it was better than two thousand and one? I thought everybody loved two thousand and one. I would still put two thousand and one above this one, but uh, but yeah, the two thousand two one, man. It uh, there, there was there was still just something really uh, special about this company at the time, and uh, I, I I think the the Rumble pay per view definitely captured. Uh, you know, how special of a time, you know, this was for everybody. So that's pretty much it, guys. And I'm out. All right.